I'm here today with Brady Dugan, who's the Chief Executive Officer of Credit Suisse, one of the largest banks in the world. And Brady, cannot thank you enough for taking the time to sit down with me today. Really, really appreciate it. Before we start talking about your career, let's talk a little bit about what life was like growing up in the Midwest. Well, I grew up in, uh, I grew up in Illinois, and I actually grew up in a small town. So, I mean, I grew up in a town that at the time was, I think, less than 10,000 people. So it was a real... Uh, it was, I'd say, a very uh, small town, ordinary experience. I had, uh, I had one brother and three sisters, so it was kind of a large family. But uh, you know, it was a, I'd say, it was a pretty, uh, uh, pretty ordinary, uh, you know, sort of middle class upbringing in a small town in the Midwest. So it was, uh, and I think that was, I think that's, uh, it, you know, was an interesting training ground for everything I've done since. And so you went to the University of Chicago. Mm -hmm. And did you have any clue at that time that you were going to go into finance? Well, you know, it's interesting because I did a lot of things. In high school, I did a lot of things. I mean, you know, obviously academics, but I was also, you know, in sports, you know, three-sport athlete. I did a lot of music, so I did, I had, uh, you know, I did a lot in the school music stuff, but we also had, you know, a rock band and did all sorts of things. So I was pretty active in a lot of different areas. And as I got to the end of high school, I just decided, you know, I was really going to focus on business and that that was something that I really had a passion for and that that's what I wanted to spend my time doing. And so then I took all, all that effort that I had kind of spread out across all these other areas, I really focused on uh, business. And so I did things like, you know, I went to the University of Chicago uh, as an undergraduate. And, you know, it's a very much a liberal arts program. Um, but at the same time, what I did is I took accounting classes at night at DePaul. I also started to work pretty early. Uh, I went to work for a bank in Chicago. So I'd go to school on the main campus, and then I'd go downtown and work for what at the time was called uh, Central National Bank. You know, as, as you know, I mean, Illinois had like 12,000 of the 14,000 banks in, um, in the United States at the time because they had these branch banking laws. But I worked at the bank for actually two or three years while I was going to school. Um, mm -hmm. So I'd go to school full time and I'd also work, worked in the controller's department, did interesting things there. So it was a, you know, my, my view is that that was all really good preparation for what I wanted to do ultimately. And yeah, I, I basically decided that's where I wanted to focus and that's what I wanted to spend my time doing. So you went from University of Chicago and then you immediately went and you got, got your MBA? I did, yeah. They had, it was really interesting. They had a program at the time they called Professional Option Program where you do uh, basically a total, total the, the, the actual program was a total five-year program. So you do three years undergrad and then two years of your MBA. Um, I think I did it in about four and a half years. So, uh, but basically went straight through. Uh, so basically did did the undergraduate program, went straight into the business school. And this actually was great because I'd already taken the economics at an undergrad level, you know, the statistics, the, the accounting I'd already taken at night. So I really could start in the business school at a fairly uh, advanced level, even in my first year. And so, yeah, I went straight through. And actually a lot, a number of people actually from those classes, like for instance, one, one of the guys in my class was John Winkleried. Who obviously went on to do, you know, became, uh, I, you know, I think co-president at Goldman Sachs. We had actually a lot of people who did pretty well out of that program, and it was uh, it was a great program. I think they're actually now, um, you know, reintroducing in certain ways those those programs. I think they kind of got off that for a while, but they're now looking at that again. So it's uh, it was a really interesting program. It was a great experience. And then you went to Bankers Trust, but what was? We've got a lot of young folks that look at these uh, uh, videos. What was your job hunt like when you came out of school? You know, I talked to a lot of different, lot of different companies, um, and um, you know, I was really looking for what I thought was the, uh, you know, the, what I thought offered the greatest opportunity. And so, um, at the time, as you say, I went to Bankers Trust. Bankers Trust was at the time sort of an up, upstart in the investment banking area. So I went to work in their investment bank. I did a number of different things there. Um, worked on the M and A area, worked in venture capital. That was actually just the beginning of some of the some of the leverage buyouts. So I worked on some of those, which was interesting. But where I settled was actually in the derivatives area. And Bankers Trust ended up being one of the you know one of the top players in derivatives very quickly um, because it was an area that was developing so quickly that you know they didn't have to be established in that area. If you had smart people doing interesting things and innovating, you could actually grow that. And so that that was what was interesting to me about Bankers Trust. It had a real you know, it had a real upstart feel to it, and that was uh, that was attractive to me. Got it. And then then you made a move. Uh, what inspired that? We had a very close knit group at, at Bankers Trust, and uh, you know, I, I worked for uh, Alan Wheat, um, who was the head of really the derivatives group there. I worked for him at Bankers Trust probably for mm, uh, maybe seven eight years. Um, and you know, I think he was he looked at a, at a move to go to a platform. 
um, at Credit Suisse, which he thought would combine, you know, the extremely strong balance sheet strength with a broader reach, the First Boston and the Credit Suisse First Boston reach from an investment banking point of view for that business. And so I think we thought that it was a pretty, that was a pretty interesting uh, combination. And was also interesting because we were, we were basically able to rebuild the business almost from the ground up. It's almost, like, it almost like starting a new business in this area. Did you ever imagine when you were in school that you would be where you are today? Because you've lived the American dream. You've gone from you know, being a junior person in finance to now being the CEO of one of the largest banks in the world, which is a huge, uh, huge feat. Um, did you ever conceive of that? Um, there, I was never in a job thinking, you know, I want that job next. Mm -hmm. That was never my approach. My approach was always, I'm going to do the very best job I can in this. And if somebody comes along and, and suggests something or offers something, am I absolutely going to take it? Because I actually think that's one of the most important things you can do is take advantage of opportunities. But I never really had a long-term plan of, well, you know, I'm going to spend three years doing this and then five years doing that. And, um, but really, my, my focus was always very much on, you know, sinking into whatever the task was at hand and trying to do the very best job I could on that. And if I did a good job, you know, then, um, you know, then obviously maybe, uh, you know, other things would await after that. But, you know, there was always the necessity to really do the very best job you could in whatever job you were in. So that was, that was probably, that was my approach. So as you say, I'm not sure I ever had this vision of I'm going to end up in 30 years in any particular job. Over the years, Credit Suisse has gone through a number of, of evolutions, if you will, or, or changes. Um, how have you managed it? Because it, it's, it's, it seems like the firm is really on the right track and it's doing, doing very well. But I know that there have been some rough times. I know that there have been some uh, interesting times, even when you guys merged with DLJ, for example, uh, back in those times. Tell us a little bit about that. I actually think that, that the, the most uh, consistent thing about this industry is change. And so you better be able to adapt you better be able to innovate, you better be able to adapt. Um, and uh, I think that's one of the great things about the industry is because that then creates opportunity. And in fact, I think it's one of the reasons why this as an industry is great for people coming in at an entry level because the new ideas are not coming from the guy who's been here for 30, 35 years in the industry. They're coming from the new people who come. If you talk about, I mean, today, if you look at how's technology going to reshape this industry, it's going to reshape this industry. Who's more likely to figure that out, me or somebody coming in at an entry level? And I think that's actually one of the really um, interesting things about it. And frankly, back to the question on, on Credit Suisse, I mean, I think we have, um, I think we've done a good job of adapting and, you know, being, um, I think, very proactive about, uh, you know, making uh, changes in the business model and adapting to the environment. I mean, I look at, you know, when we came out of the crisis in 2008, you know, a lot of banks said, you know, you know, there's no need for change in regulation. You know, that was just a, you know, that was an aberration. You know, things are, you know, things don't need to fundamentally change. Our view was, yeah, things did need to change. And so we very much, you know, we, we I think, engaged very constructively in ideas around how to actually make the, the in industry safer, uh, to make it, you know, more secure. You know, we did things like we were one of the first to come out and talk about bail-inable debt, you know, which is an important part of the capital structure of banks now with, you know, TLAC they talk about now or COCOs and things like that. We were probably one of the first banks to really come out and say, we think this is the way forward. You know, let's create contingent capital to help make the banking system much safer. So I think actually, you know, that, that whole concept of change and managing change, it's a really, I mean, I think it's important probably for all businesses, but I think it's really important for our industry because, you know, things are, you know, constantly changing. You have to do a good job of managing change. So Brady, you became the CEO of Credit Suisse in 2007 and then 2008 hit us over the head. Uh, what was that whole experience like? Well, you're right. I mean, it is kind of interesting because, uh, yeah, I actually, I actually took on the role in May of 07, and actually pretty immediately after a lot of the mortgage issues started to happen, you know, and as you say, that then led into 2008. But it was pretty volatile um, even in 2007. So, um, you know, a lot of people would argue it's kind of the booby prize to, you know, become a CEO of a global bank at that time. Um, and, you know, I think there's been, there have been a lot of challenges, there's no doubt. But it's also been, I think, a great time to, if you look at how much the, the actual pecking order has changed in the industry, it's changed an awful lot over that period. So there are huge opportunities. I mean, it's been a very interesting period because on the one hand, um, you know, 
correct decisions were rewarded pretty handsomely and wrong decisions were punished severely. I mean, you know, obviously you have banks that went out of business. And our view is that we wanted to sort of take our strategy much more to a client-based strategy, a lower risk strategy, rely more on third-party capital and things. And we actually, it was interesting because we actually presented that strategy um, to the board in I think June of 2007. And so it was actually really well-timed in terms of what was going to happen, as you said, over the next year and a half. In 2009, a lot of people argued that we were one of the couple banks that had really come out of it, you know, the best in terms of the crisis. But it was really a period where, you know, there was so much going on. You know, you talk about, uh, you know, managing a business, uh, you know, wasn't even, you know, wasn't quarter to quarter, it wasn't month to month. It was almost like, you know, hour to hour in terms of having to respond to things that happened. So it was a pretty, pretty challenging time, I think. Um, but, you know, but also very interesting. And I think we made a, you know, we made a lot of progress. I mean, I think in our private bank, for instance, I think we've probably brought in more customer assets um, since the crisis than any other firm. And part of the reason for that is because we, I think, came out of the crisis in very good shape. How do you keep the culture of the firm going? I mean, it's fascinating. You're the CEO of a Swiss company, uh, and uh, that's a big move from the Swiss perspective, uh, you know, to bring in an American to, to run the company. But trying to create a culture uh, amongst a company that's got tens of thousands of employees, how do you do that? People will listen to what you say, but they'll watch what you do. And I think the most important thing is making sure that you're conducting yourself and making the decisions around the organization in ways that are you know, absolutely crystal clear, they're consistent with the culture that you want to have. Um, one of the things that we had come up with is a goal to try to be an admired institution, an admired bank. You know, we can't have a manual that basically, you know, uh, people can look into for every decision they have to make every day. I mean, you know, we have close to 50,000 people. They're probably making thousands of decisions every day, and they can't every time they have a decision to make go to the manual and look at, you know, page 43, and there it is in paragraph C. Oh, that's what I do. They have to have a unifying principle around that. And so what we hope people do is when they walk in every morning is to think about, you know, what would, you know, how, if we want to be an admired bank, how do I respond to this? What do I do to make sure that we're admired? And our view is that that's, you know, that's, that's much broader than just obey the rules or obey the laws or obey our policies. It's what do we want to do to really treat our clients right, treat our employees right, and, and ultimately be an admired bank. And we think that's a good unifying principle. Of, of course, we're not perfect. We make mistakes. Our people make mistakes. We make mistakes as an institution. I make mistakes. Um, but we try to use that as a unifying principle to try to bring that culture together because as you mentioned it's you know it's a global business you've got lots of differences across countries differences across business units and those are all things that you know trying to pull those all together in a tight way is is a challenge and it takes constant effort